Today I've got a really cool dual Ice Lake Xeon motherboard. Kind of rare that I get server stuff that is this new. Usually uh, the hand-me-down stuff from data centers is uh, a bit older, but this stuff is just one generation behind. It came out in 2021. It, this particular board from Supermicro takes dual Skylake Xeons and it is really packed with stuff and it is one of the coolest motherboards I've ever seen. Uh, at least in person. Uh, I don't normally get th this kind of stuff, but this particular one is missing a couple CPU pins, so I got it for like $70. And it does actually work with one CPU. Uh, I tested it with the other one. It doesn't work with a second CPU, but following recording this video, I've actually sent it in to get it repaired, and it only cost me 50 bucks. But it's gonna be like two, three months before Supermicro gets it back to me. It uses a 10 nanometer process for the CPUs, and they're pretty powerful. It's still being used until Sapphire Rapids comes out. I think it's Sapphire Rapids? Sapphire Rapids, when it comes out in now, I mean, it's, it's supposed to be January 2023, but I don't know when they're actually shipping them out or if you know, Google and stuff already have them, that sort of thing. I think it's worth taking a look at because this is some crazy high-end hardware that normal mortals no, don't normally get to deal with. This motherboard in particular is the Supermicro X12 DPI N6. There's an N6T or an NT6. There's another version of this that comes with 10 gig ethernet. This one doesn't have it, so little lame, but whatever. It obviously supports two CPUs, eight memory slots per CPU, plus a mystery black slot on each CPU. It has lots of PCI Express slots. All of these are 4.0. It has remote management through IPMI. It has an incredibly boring selection of ports, COM port, Ethernet for the IPMI, four USB 3.0 connectors, two gigabit Ethernet ports. Like I said, it's 10 gig on the other model and VGA, <laughs> and that's it. There are no other ports on this thing, and this is a very expensive board. I've seen these on eBay for $1,500. I don't know what they really go for, probably in the $600 range. Finding CPUs for them is really hard because the CPUs and motherboards usually flood the market once companies upgrade, but from what I can tell, they haven't really upgraded yet so a lot of these are still hard to find like just finding like a retail cpu is very difficult and the cpus are freaking gigantic <laughs> so as a side note they're really freaking big and heavy this motherboard has so many crazy features other than the lame ports these sockets in black will accept an optane dim module this is 128 gigs of optane memory that basically just shows up as RAM. If you put this into the board, uh, side note, this particular RAM module will not work in this. I'll explain that in a minute, but you can install this in the board and you now have RAM backed with 128 gigs of memory. So it's like an overflow into the slower RAM and it just does it magically. Apparently you, you can switch it to different modes where if an app is actually designed to take advantage of this, it can show up as a drive or as a like a memory partition that it's aware of Optane and it will specifically target it for specific caching needs. However, you can just run it as memory and it's just extra memory that has a bit higher latency and slower times, but it's just like you just instantly got an extra, they make, 512 gig sticks of this. I think they also make, they might make one terabytes, but I think I know they make 512. The catch is with this one, and if you're someone who's familiar with the Ice Lake platform, is this is the persistent memory 100. This only accepts the 200 series, which right now is impossible to find. They are extremely expensive. I pay, even this one, which is old and does not work in this, it just maps it out and says it's not a valid memory stick and you can't do anything with it. The 200 series, which is, this is listed as being compatible with, are still really expensive. I mean like thousands of dollars. 
So I got to wait until those things hit the market and go down in price, and then maybe I can get one. I think it'd be really funny to play with, especially since I don't do any real like proper server stuff. With this, I, I think this whole motherboard supports four terabytes of RAM, although the processors themselves I think are six. I'm sure they make other models that have more memory slots. Looking around on the board, there is an internal USB 3 connector, another COM port, because you need those, USB 3 as well for the front panel, a single M.2, which is kind of annoying, because I would like two of them, to have a redundant boot drive for VM storage. This one, I accidentally, uh, I was unscrewing the NVMe drive I had in here and it took the soldered on nut with it. It just unscrewed it off the board. So I'll have to super glue that. This is the chipset. I forgot the number for this thing. It's like the C621A or something like that. They actually make variants of the chipset that have offloading for encryption built into the chipset, which is really funny and kind of crazy that they have like coprocessors installed on the chipset. Epic CPUs, at least the newer ones, have this built in. They're technically like a system on a chip. The platform controller hub or whatever you want to call it chipset is incorporated into every processor. So you're missing this big chip on the board. These SFF8087 connectors allow you to plug in 12 drives to it they don't actually support SAS. These are normally used on SAS cards. Wait, I got one right here. See, normally on SAS cards. Oddly enough, these only support SATA because they're just running off the platform controller hub and that thing only supports SATA. So you lose out on any SAS goodness. It doesn't have a SAS controller on it. There's two extra ports here. I don't know why they're orange, <laughs> but there's some orange SAS, SATA ports. So you can have 14 SATA hard drives without even adding a card. And there are a lot of card slots for drive controllers. So this thing can have a lot of drives. There are these funky connectors labeled NVMe on the motherboard. And I looked at these and went, what the hell are those? I've never seen those before. Turns out each one of these connectors carries eight PCI Express 4.0 lanes, meaning that these two connectors provide you with four NVMe drives all running on 4.0 speed, which is awesome. I did actually forget the name of these connectors, so I'll have to put that in. This is the connector. It uses a PCB edge connector and just plugs in. And there you go. On the other end, it has a Molex connector for power that goes to both. And it has two U.2 connectors for NVMe drives. So that's a lot of drives just in the little drive section before even getting to anything regarding PCI Express. Although I am kind of annoyed that they only put one M.2 on this thing. Kind of standard VRMs for servers. I think these top out at around 250 t watts TDP. The CPUs that I have are 205 watt TDP chips. There's some more fan connectors. This thing has a bunch of fan connectors. ATX power, two EPS power connectors. Looks like there is space for a third one. They didn't use it. And just moving along, there's really nothing else. It's a very basic board. It just has lots of slots and lots of RAM. Uh, there's some other oddball connectors that are used for like weird network cards and interfaces to them. Four 16x slots and two 8x slots is a lot of PCI Express 4.0. And again, Epic has even more PCI Express lanes. I think these are 64 lanes per CPU and Epic is 128. This is the LGA 4189 socket. Technically it's the 4189-5 socket because there's a four because there was this whole thing where I think Facebook wanted early access to CPUs. So they made a custom platform just for it uses the same socket except modified ever so slightly and it uses older 14 nanometer chips instead of the 10 nanometers that this one supports. So they're slightly different incompatible platforms because Intel. The CPUs that I have are these engineering sample 1.8 gigahertz base clock versions of the Intel Pentium scalable third generation blah 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 8253Y. These are 32 core, 64 thread. The retail version can go up to 3.4 gigahertz, but I think that's only on a couple cores. I'm not really sure about their all core speed, but this one in particular 
gets up to, I think it's 2.3 or 2.4 gigahertz all core, which is still pretty impressive. I mean, it's a 10 nanometer chip. It's, it's modern. I mean, they're really fast. This thing handily beats my Intel 7980XE with 36 cores, well, 36 threads. On the back, you can see it's a pretty standard LGA chip with tons and tons of connections. Most engineering sample chips stop working when you like update the BIOS and stuff like that. So with this particular board, you have to have BIOS version 1.1B or earlier. Anything newer, I think they went up, they're at like 3.0 or something. You can't update that. If you update it, your chip won't work. I haven't tested it myself, but the Chinese reseller also backed up this claim. So I'm pretty sure you can't do it. They do make a 40 core 80 thread version of this for some ungodly amount of money. I have a pair of CPU coolers for this, two different ones. I actually had a third different one because I originally bought the cheapest one that I could find on eBay, which was a Dynatron N11. And it was a 2U sized one. And I just thought it got way too hot. It needed to run really fast in order to keep it cool. So I picked up this super micro version. It's got some ridiculous part number, and this is made for a 4U server. Uses a 92 millimeter fan. It's a lot quieter. This is a more expensive version from Noctua that includes two fans. Arguably, it's a much better deal. It's like $20 more. You get two Noctua fans, and it's Noctua quality. It's obviously designed to handle a serious amount of cooling. So, if, uh, if I do manage to get the board replaced properly and repaired, I will probably sell this off and replace it with another Noctua just because it's so nice and they're quiet. Although this cooler is pretty quiet for a super micro. Now, like a lot of their really high-end CPUs and like server chips, they use really bizarre mounting brackets and stuff. So they're a little weird to install. It's kind of cool. So I'm going to go over how you set up one of these CPUs. You have to take the CPU, find the little triangle, like most CPUs. You take the carrier frame and you look for the triangle on that, which isn't even really indicated. It's just a little triangle in the corner. And then you take the two and you put them together. And there's little clips that look extremely fragile. So I'm sure one of these days I'm going to break one of these. And since I'm filming it, that day will probably be today. But you clip this whole thing together. There, now all four corners are clipped in. Fun fact, there's this little lever here. Because when the thermal paste is on this, there's so much force that you need to separate the two. This thing just like pries the chip off. You get this done. Now you have the module. Now what's cool about this is I don't have one of the trays, but when you have the plastic trays that all of these uh, CPUs come in, it's actually designed that you can assemble this while the CPU is in the tray. Like the tray has grooves so you can put this carrier frame into the tray, latch it on, and then remove it as one unit without ever touching the CPU really. Now that you've got the CPU installed, you need to apply thermal paste. Since this is a thermal paste application on the internet, we have to apply it in a very specific way, which is whatever the most triggering thing that you can possibly do. That's the correct way. Otherwise, it's not a proper thermal paste application. If you just do a line or a couple dots and an X or whatever, or even if AMD or Intel have a specific guideline of how to do it that's wrong because you did it the wrong way because if you did an x that means you're supposed to do a line if you did a line that means you're supposed to smooth it out it's just common knowledge you have to just do it the proper internet way There we go, that's the proper way. You have partial spread, partial random dots, uneven dots across a smear and a random one. So that's perfect. Then you wanna figure out which way you're gonna mount your CPU. So in this case, the fan is blowing this way. And let's say this is gonna be CPU number one. The triangle is located here. So I want this blowing this way. So I'm gonna want the triangle up here. 
and then there's clips in each corner when this is flipped over the triangle is going to be in the right spot and then you have your processor module there are these little clasps on either end of the cpu module they flip in and out you want them over the socket or over the uh, screws so you just push them all in install the cpu and now you clip down each one of these now these are to prevent it from tilting apparently then you take a torx 30 screwdriver screw in each one of these little plastic nuts and you torque them down to eight inch pounds which i had to go out and buy a stupid torque wrench screwdriver thing like a little one that could go down to eight inch pounds 10 a lot easier to get than below 10. interesting note when i was reading the manual for the dynatron fan that i have or cooler that i have it specifically said make sure to tighten the peak nuts now peak being uppercase it stands for poly ether ether ketone or ether ketone it is a really fancy alien plastic it is super strong it's like radiation resistant it's biocompatible you can make implants out of it it goes up to like 345 degrees celsius before it melts it is just like a crazy alien technology plastic and it's funny that they specifically mention the type of plastic in the instructions rather than than just saying tighten the nuts it's it's like saying tighten the abs nuts like they went out of their way to mention the plastic that it was made of which i thought was kind of funny the super micro version also has the same design so i guess that's guidance from intel to uh use those plastic nuts i'm sure there's some technical reason for it maybe uh, to give it a little bit of compliance or something it's funny because i think that's the only time i've ever seen peak in person you can actually buy rolls of filament for 3d printers that are peak and if you have a really high-end printer that can heat up to like three four hundred degrees celsius and an enclosed chamber and all that stuff you can actually print peak at home <laughs> the catch being that one you need the really crazy printer and two whereas a normal roll of fin printer filament can be 15 to 20 dollars it's 300 or more to get peak so you better have some really important things to print one thing that's cool about this particular platform is that it supports up to ddr 3200 ddr4 3200 memory as opposed to the older platforms that are limited to like 2666 that sort of speeds in fact that's one of the limiting factors of this is that it's a lot slower than the pmem 200 the catch is finding ddr for 3200 ecc memory it's expensive especially if you get bigger modules in the meantime i have like 64 gigs of random memory that i've been testing around i have noticed that this board will not boot with standard memory i have never encountered that before it will just not start up if you don't have ecc memory if i can get it repaired for a decent price i will actually use this board i'm tempted to use it regardless with just the one cpu since i know that works basically all of the lanes from cpu number two just go out to pci express slots so you only get like two of these if you don't have the second cpu installed which is kind of a big bummer that being said it's still pretty awesome even with one cpu so i might just use it regardless